We have to realize we're all, all on this path. We're all dependent on a savior. We're all imperfect. And, um, you know, we all have ups and downs. We are Saints in the South, your source for gospel growth and good times. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Saints in the South, episode 216. We got Kenny, the Rogue Bishop, and myself, Jackson. And we might have uh, Mr. Average Joe join us here a little bit later. We'll see, though. But uh, hope everybody had a wonderful conference weekend. And um, hope you got everything out of it that you hope to have gotten out of it. The great thing about conference is we have the opportunity over the next six months to continue to get things out mm-hmm. of it, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. Good old good, good old technology. Uh, in our opening prayer before we started, Kenny mentioned technology and what a wonderful blessing it is to be able to be able to access these talks, not just from this past six months, but what, what I think it was, what, 1973 or something like that, that you can access general conference talks? Sometimes yeah, in the 70s. 70s. Yeah. yeah, when they started recording them, I guess. So yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. It's kind of cool to go back and listen to those old talks sometimes too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, so this week we are in Enos through Words of Mormon, and to kick it off here, we have uh, the "Come Follow Me" opening message. It says, "Although Enos went to the forest to hunt beasts to satisfy physical hunger, he ended up staying there all day and into the night because his soul hungered." This hunger led Enos to raise his voice high that it reached the heavens. He described this experience as a wrestle before God. From Enos, we learn that prayer is a sincere effort to draw near to God and seek to know his will. When you pray with this intent, you are more likely to discover, as Enos did, that God hears you and truly cares about you, your loved ones, and even your enemies. When you know his will, you are better able to do his will. Like Mormon, you may not know you may not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things. Wherefore, he worketh in you to do according to his will. And I think with that, Michael, it's going to kick it off. Okay. Um, I, I'm also reminded that um, um, I, it was a member of the 70, and I can't remember yet who it was, but he talked about, um, you know, a, a pillar a pillar of light versus little like rays of light. Bed. Huh? Not like a pillar on your bed? No, sir. A pillar, pillar like you lay your head on? No, sir. <laughs> That's only in the South that you have those pillars. Oh, he's, try, he's trying to fill Joe, Joe's role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's> failing miserably. <laughs> no, he talked about how Joseph Smith, there was a pillar of light and that, you know, it wouldn't it be great if we could all see a pillar of light. But he talked about the rays of light that add up to be a pillar of light. Do you guys remember that talk? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sort of. Not really. So. It was good. But <laughs> it was very it was very profound because I think it is the, it leads into the same thing here. You know, um, it would be great if, if we could have those experiences, but we have to realize that it's line upon line and precept upon precept, and that's exactly what he talked about in the talk and how we learn those things and all these these rays of light that we receive, these uh, sparks of, of truth that we receive from the Holy Ghost, the inspiration that we get, the, the little blessings and the little rays of hope and stuff, all added up equals a pillar. And so uh, the thing that reminded me when Enos was praying in, in the wilderness, you know, he his soul hungered, right? And it talks about that and how he prayed all day and even into the evening. And uh, he had great faith. And then, then his prayer was actually answered. He heard, you know, the audible, Enos, thy sins will be forgiven thee. And he had that great talk. The only thing that that I thought about was, well, how many of us have had that kind of great faith and we prayed into the morning and all morning and into the day and, and into the night and nothing happened? You know, we had the great faith that 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 we would be healed and it, it didn't happen. We had we fasted and prayed that that marriages would would stay together and that people would honor their covenants and it didn't happen. 
Um, and I rem I'm reminded of a talk uh, by Elder Bednar um, entitled Accepting the Lord's Will and Timing. This is not a conference talk. This is um, a, uh, uh, he was talking to the church educational system uh, people that, that are in the church educational system. It was a devotional um, that he gave at the University of Texas uh, back in um, uh, March 3rd of 2013, I believe. Um, but anyway, he, he, he talks about this, and I gave a talk on this once um, because I think it's very I think it's very profound, you know, because sometimes we might think, well, I just didn't have enough faith. Well, I didn't get healed or there, this person didn't get healed or this didn't happen because my faith wasn't sufficient. We can and we can allow Satan to start really getting down on us and 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 making us feel like that we're, we're not worthy or we didn't have enough faith or we didn't put enough into it, et cetera, et cetera. And he recounts that he uh, had an experience um, with uh, with someone that um, he had served with on his mission. And uh, he didn't use their names, but he was talking about, he named them John and Heather. But he recounts how John had gotten cancer and um, was, you know, asked for a blessing. And uh, Elder Bednar, of course, asked, you know, said, sure, of course I did. And then he said that when he went to go give that blessing to John, he said he, I quote from Elder Bednar, I then posed questions I had not planned to ask and had not ne had never previously considered. He says, John, do you have the faith not to be healed? If it is the will of our Heavenly Father that you are transferred by death in your youth to the spirit world, to continue your ministry, do you have the faith sub to submit to his will and not be healed? I was, I was like, wow, uh, what really a cool. question. Yeah. And then he continued on uh, with, um, he said that sometime later he received a letter from John and Heather uh, that, that the cancer, well, the cancer left. And then sometime later he got a, he got a letter from John and Heather Again, not their real names, saying that the cancer had returned and that they had to resume chemotherapy. And he said that John explained in this letter, he said to Elder Bednar, not only did this news come as a disappointment to Heather and me, but we were puzzled by it. Was there something we did not learn the first time? Did the Lord expect something more from us? You know, and we can all have these kind of questions. You know, did I not have enough faith? What happened here? Why, why has it returned? Or why was I not healed at all? Um, and then he said that, uh, that after this experience, he knew that having faith, at least in his circumstance, was not necessarily knowing that he would, that he would heal but that he could heal and he had to believe that he could. And then whatever happened was up to him. In other words, he was, he was um, kind of to, to him. It was, there was two separate, there's two separate points. There was like having faith to be healed and then, and then God's will or God's timing. And he, he always looked at those as two different things, but he said this brought him to consider and realize that they're actually the same thing, that, that, that they're all in one. And then I liked how Elder Besnar uh, summarized this. And I think this is, to me, this is what really helped, uh, because not all of us are going to have an experience like Enos. Not all of us are going to have an experience like um, like uh, Peter. Uh, I know, I tried to walk on water, and it didn't happen. I sank, I sunk, I sank, and I sunk in the water. The water is it <laughs> on my pillar. Um, and I that happened to me when I was a child. So you can't tell me that I didn't have childlike faith because I did. Because um, I was a child. Duh. But Elder Bednar said this. He said, righteousness and faith certainly are instrumental in moving mountains. If moving mountains accomplishes God's purposes and is in accordance with his will. Mm. Righteousness and faith certainly are instrumental in healing the sick, the deaf, and lame, if such healing 
accomplishes God's purposes and is in accordance with His will. Thus, even if we have strong faith, many mountains will not be moved, and not all of the sick and infirm will be healed. If all opposition were curtailed, if all maladies were removed, then the primary purposes of the Father's plan would be frustrated. Mm. Close quote. Uh, there was some kind of a CES devotional where he did a Q&A, and um, a young lady in the audience asked uh, Elder Bednar the question of how, how do I prepare to prepare myself to receive revelation when it comes? And his, his answer kind of surprised her because his response was, you're asking the wrong question. It's not a matter of when revelation comes because you are in revelation right now. Revelation is ongoing. Mm -hmm. And I thought of that when you were talking about the, the little rays of light that all come together to form a pillar, because it, it's not like we, you know, I, now and then we we might have these little moments where we feel like we get it but that's not it's not because the lord has decided to all of a sudden let us in on something that you know that we didn't have access to you know we we it's us putting the pieces together like he's he's constantly trying to guide us and trying to give us the inspiration that we need and we have to keep ourselves in a state of being constantly receptive just like Elder Bednar says, like the inspiration, spiritual inspiration is there and revelation is, is ongoing. We're in the middle of it. And, you know, it's often not until later on after the fact that we're able to look back on our lives and see how an event in our life or something that somebody said to us was part of the revelation that, that we needed when we were able to put the pieces together. Very, very good thoughts uh, from both of you. A couple things on the mountains, moving mountains. Sometimes those mountains aren't moved, which is what Elder Bednar had mentioned. Correct, mm -hmm. Michael? I think in those instances, and let me know what y'all think, maybe in those times when the mountain isn't moved, maybe, maybe it's ourselves that is the mountain that, mm -hmm. that, that has to be moved. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like for, for, for whatever for whatever it is that we're going through, maybe we are the mountain that has to get through, that has to be moved, that has to, to get over whatever it is we're, we're going through uh, in, in exercising that that faith. Uh, when the, in those times when the mountain, when the figurative mountain is, is not moved in our lives the way we want it to be or the way we anticipate or the way that we believe that we're exercising our faith, Maybe, maybe we are that mountain that has to be moved in such a way to, you know, to put our li ourselves more in line with the will of the Lord. Yeah, like that old song, uh, drop kicked by Jesus through the goalposts of life. Sometimes you gotta <laughs> just go where the Lord takes you. That's funny. Um, right. well, I know there's, there's lots of things to take from this, from Enos's experience. Um, I've got a couple things, but I want to hear from Joe or. Well, I'll, I'll piggyback on what uh, Michael was just talking about. I, re I remember a story um, from when I was younger about a, a man who was uh, very strongly felt that he was led by God to, uh, to push against this, this massive boulder and to have faith and to push against this massive boulder. And I might be messing this story up because it's from a while ago. I'm getting older as each day passes. But anyway, uh, that was his calling. Go push against this massive boulder. And so he did, and it didn't budge. So every day he'd go out there and push and push and push, and he had faith, and he would pray, and he would push, and this boulder never budged. And after quite some time, uh, maybe years or whatever, he, he kind of prayed to God and said, you know, why? Why have you given me this task? And I've had faith, and I've prayed, and I've done all the things you've told me to, and this boulder has never budged an inch. And his, uh, the answer to his prayer was, you're right. And the boulder didn't move, but that wasn't the task. The task wasn't for you to move it. The task was, was for you to push. And now look, look how your muscles have developed. 
and look how your faith has grown. And now, now you're ready to do the work I have for you to do. Um, and these other tasks and things. Uh, so now you're prepared and now you're strong enough to do those things. But the, the task was never to move that boulder. So I thought it was an interesting little takeaway. So the mor moral of the story is, um, you know, if there's a big task in front of you, don't take it for granted. Oh. <laughs> Oh gosh! Knew it was coming. Yeah. Oh yeah. There it was. We 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 were waiting for it. <laughs> well, so, and I think um, another thing on um, on having faith too, and and listening to the spirit and being prepared to receive uh, revelation is um, sometimes I think I know that uh, I talk to the youth a lot about this, but I think even as adults, sometimes we forget that we've had hands placed on our head to have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. And when you have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, sometimes it's hard to recognize that he's there all the time. And so you start looking for these great revelations or these, these great awe-inspiring moments or whatever, um, and, and, you, and you think that you don't have the Spirit or that you're not receiving revelation or inspiration because you don't have these great moments. But the reality is you have it all the time. And it's constant, and you've been given that gift. And so as you, and Elder Bednar gave another talk about that. He said, so when, you, when you're wondering, you know, if you should do something or not, and it seems like something good to do, but you can't decide whether it's from your own subconscious or it's from the Holy Ghost, he said, here's the answer. Don't worry about it. Stop fretting about it. Just go do it. Yeah, that's, that's I love pretty good, that. man. That that talk literally changed my life. It's no exaggeration to say that literally, because I struggle so hard with that um, constantly, man. I I'm the type of person that I, I I question every decision I make and second guess myself all the time, and every time I feel like I received some kind of a spiritual prompting, I'm like, was that a spiritual prompting or is that just was that my own head? Is that just the voice in my own head telling me that I should do this thing? Or, or was that actually the Lord trying to tell me that, that, that this is something I need to do? And man, that, that talk was such a weight off my shoulders because I realized in that moment, it doesn't matter. If I feel, if I feel this, the, this drive to do something good, do it. It doesn't matter if the voice at that moment is coming from inside of me or from God. If it's, if it's something good, then ultimately all things do come from God. True that. Yep. A couple, uh, a couple of things that I had here. For one, I think it's interesting that, you know, with the with the passing down of the plates, you know, from Lehi to Nephi, and naturally think it would go to one of Nephi's sons. You know, it doesn't. It makes a lateral move and goes to Jacob, his brother, mm -hmm. and then down uh, Jacob's line. And then it goes down a few, uh, there's several, you know, several sons and sons and sons and sons that are mentioned. And then it makes another lateral move uh, with it, with another uh, one of these individuals in the, uh, in the chain there. But uh, what I love about Enos's experience is that he didn't set out to go and seek for forgiveness of sins or to, uh, go out and seek for revelation. He was going out to hunt, mm -hmm. according to his writings. Right? He was he was going to get food for his family. Okay, and he's going all day and all night. So I'm sure, and I would think that his wife and children are like, "Hey, Dad, where you at?" Yeah, and hopefully, we're, you know, we're, while we're hungry here. <laughs> That's right. Right. Absolutely. So, so I love that aspect of it, um, and it made me think of. Michael talking about how most of the time when he's driving that he doesn't listen to anything that he's communicating uh, with Heavenly Father uh, while he's driving. And uh, just a reminder to me, because I love to listen to things, whether it's a podcast or radio or, a you know, a, a, a playlist on Pandora or something like that. I love to listen. And, uh, it was just a reminder to that I can, you know, put off the sound there more often than I do. 
and try and listen to promptings of the Spirit. Uh, I know that's when I get a lot of my, uh, I was talking with the seminary class this week about this story. You know, when I do a lot of my deep thinking, I'm not sitting still at a table or on a couch and just thinking. It's right. while I'm actively doing something, you know, out working in the yard or, or whatever mm-hmm. it is that my, that, that, that mind really starts to work. And I, I think this is where Enos found himself uh, as he, you know, reflected upon the things that he had been taught and had obviously had some things that he was feeling pretty bad about and feeling like he needed to repent and maybe correct a, a path that he was on. And, and that's what he ended up, uh, ended up being able to do there. So I love how, how he got into this mode in this, this situation here. Hmm. Wasn't it Bishop Moore that talked about his revelatory shower experience or something like that? He, his shower of revelation wasn't, didn't he talk about that? Yeah. He, something like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He talks about, he, that's where he gets a lot of his revelation <laughs> as is in the shower. You know, hey, you know what? Everybody gets them differently, you know? And, and, um, uh, my wife, um, she, she doesn't like the silence. She, um, she likes to listen to the radio or songs, or a lot of times she'll listen to conference talks or she'll mm-hmm. listen to, um, EFY music, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody's different, you know, uh, we, we all, but I can tell you this, that she's just as spirit, just ever bit as spiritual and, and receives revelation just as much or more than I do. Uh, but everybody does it different. So if it, if it works for you to like drive in silence, great. If it doesn't work for you, then don't, I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's very possible if Enos had a playlist back then, he might've been had the AirPods in. He too probably well. would have <laughs> listened to your podcast, Jackson. Yeah, he'd been listening to, right. he'd been like saints in the South. That's me. That's right. I'm striving, baby. <laughs> well, he's a hunter. So, you know, he's probably uh, that mindset anyway. That's right. <laughs> yeah. He's out there getting him a deer. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on the wall. <laughs> That's right. And I'm going to get that buck. <laughs> but, you know, you talked about, you know, he, his goal wasn't necessarily to receive revelation or to receive forgiveness of his sins. Right. But it was cool that 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 it happened, and uh, I like the fact that that he did that. There's um, and I, it it escapes me right now who who talked about this, but there was a, a a talk about from one of our apostles about forgiveness and and oh, it's it was Elder Iring, I uh, President Iring. He uh, it was in one of his books that he wrote. He talked about. You know, how how do you know when you're really forgiven? Because you want to have that joy that you're forgiven, that you, you want to have that joy that, that you can feel good. And, and Satan, he's such a jerk because, you know, just when you start to feel good, it's like, oh, but don't, you know, you remember when you did this and, and yeah, you, pay, you prayed for repentance, but how do you, I mean, he's just a jerk. He's on you all the time, right? I mean, from all angles and all sides. But Pres Iring said that, he said that the thing to keep in mind is is that when when you're truly trying to figure out if you've been forgiven he said if you have experiences that you feel the holy ghost whether it's because you're praying or you're listening to a talk if you feel the holy ghost in your heart witnessing to you that something is true and you then you need to know that the Holy Ghost does not dwell in unclean places. So if you feel the Holy Ghost, then you're clean. And you need to stop fretting about whether you've been forgiven or not, because you have. So go ahead and experience that joy and move on. And welcome the Holy Ghost into your life and into your heart and kick Satan out. So it was incredible book that he wrote. And uh, um, I think that we could all do well to remember that. And, uh, and maybe, you know, not be so darn so hard, so darn hard on ourselves <laughs> because it's Satan that's trying to get us to remember all the bad stuff that we did because he's trying to, f- he's trying to frustrate us so that we don't do a good work. Right. So. I would add to that. Sometimes I think Satan, he works at so many different angles um, that he is the one responsible for reminding you of bad stuff that other people have done or done to you Mm. um, essentially to where you're, you have a hard time forgiving. 
like many times, um, I think we, we judge ourselves harshly, but other times we judge other people harshly and kind of hold them to a, a, a false standard that, well, they're not perfect. They don't deserve X, Y, Z or whatever. Um, and I think the Satan's behind that as well. I um, agree. We have to realize we're all, all on this path. We're all dependent on a savior. We're all imperfect. And, um, you know, we all have ups and downs and they don't always coincide. Our, our down may be someone else's up and, and vice versa. Enos chapter one, uh, verses two and four. Um, I want to read these really quick and then comment briefly. Chapter one, verse two. And I will tell you of the wrestle which I had before God before I received a remission of my sins. And this is, of course, what we've been talking about in uh, verse four. And my soul hungered and I kneeled down before my maker and I cried unto him in mighty prayer and supplication for mine soul. And all the day long did I cry unto him. Yea, and when the night came, I did still raise my voice high that it reached the heavens. And this stood out to me. This part was really, really significant for me. Um, in part because uh, just a couple weeks ago, I got to see uh, Jordan Peterson in Jacksonville. And, you know, his tour is uh, the, the book that he's got coming out is, is titled We Who Wrestle with God. And it's based on, you know, the Old Testament story of Jacob. And this right here is an ex a, a perfect example of what, what Peterson is talking about as far as wrestling with God from like a philosophical and a psychological perspective being pouring everything you have into aiming toward the highest virtue. You know, if God is the highest virtue is the highest good that we know of, how much energy are you putting in aiming your life toward that highest good? And in this example, I, I just think it's beautiful. This, the, these couple verses here to me, I, I feel like if he did read them would be very meaningful because um, much like Jacob in the old Testament, um, this, I believe, is, is a metaphor. It's still the, the, the word wrestling is a metaphor for contending with it. For, you know, he didn't sit down and pray casually. He didn't sit down and he didn't just kind of sit down on a rock and say, all right, God, I, we need to have a chat. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a casual conversation. He literally just got down on his knees and poured out his soul to God and prayed all night, you know, just stayed there for hours in prayer. And Michael, like you said a little bit ago, like how, how many times have we done that? When you ask that question, I'm sitting there thinking, dude, I honestly don't know if I've ever done that. Like I'm, it's, it's hard enough for me to have 20 to 30 minutes of, of silent, constant prayer, you know, to be able to focus on that, um, to be able to, to stay in deep, earnest prayer in deep communion with God for hours upon hours without end like that is a definite sign of, of commitment to, to wanting to have that, the relationship with God. And like y'all just said a minute ago too, he wasn't, he wasn't seeking forgiveness of his sins, but he got it because obviously the Lord heard his prayer and his prayer was answered and, and the Lord honored his just the resoluteness with with which he approached god at that time and i think that's really it's just really really powerful because that is how we should approach god that is and and obviously i i don't i wish that i was more like that and that's what i strive for is for god to be the most important thing in my life to the point where I could kneel down and be in earnest prayer for eight hours for a whole night. You know, that's we people go and wait in line for concert tickets or, you know, to see a movie premiere for hours and hours and hours. But how many of us actually get down on our knees and cry out to God for hours and hours? Yeah, that's a good point. That's I think. Powerful. I think we've mentioned several times uh, or several of us have mentioned kind of having that time, that quiet time, whether it's hunting or 
or driving or what have you to, to ponder, to sit and ponder. And I, I feel like that's one of the challenges of, of our generation, of this generation, is the hustle generation, is the constantly on the move generation. I feel like, well, that was one of the things that drew me to this area is to kind of kind of realign life to, to, to more of what kind of, I guess, what I felt like it should be. Um, focusing on family more and uh, better work-life balance and stuff. And I think that's a big part or a part of it is to have time to just ponder, time to think about the things, as Ina said, the things that his father had told him uh, when he was younger, the, to just sit and ponder the things that are spiritual, the things that are are moral, the things that are political, just ponder. Because I feel like, our, our, our time, our society is just constantly be distracted, constantly be busy, constantly got to be doing something. Um, and I think that's, that's a distraction from what's really most important. You know, I thought it, today it hit me. Uh, matter of fact, as I was driving today, I saw, and I know you've seen them, uh, these, uh memorials on the back of someone's car glass like a rest in peace kind of thing but yeah. it was um something like that in memory of so and so such and such and i and i just thought that's kind of an odd thing that's only come about in the past what decade or so where you you see it pretty regularly and i thought it's kind of a weird thing that's like a new a new a new twist on a memorial and what what drives someone to do that to say i want to have this thing custom made and keep it on my car for as long as i have this car and it made me think you know we spend a lot more time in our cars these days i think and and i remember you know my first car was was still like of the time where you were doing good to get a hundred thousand miles out of your car and now i think for the most part people are are kind of thinking like easily double that you can easily get two hundred thousand out of out of a, a well taken care of car and now you know back in the day this is before my time but it was pretty regular to just have one car in the family now mm -hmm. it's at least two and so you're thinking at least two cars at least twice the mileage on the car probably in a quicker amount of time like you're racing to get the car paid off before you max it out and it burns up on the freeway or whatever you know barbecue style <laughs> but I'm thinking, no, no wonder that we don't have, you know, a, a memorial at our home or or time to go and and, and visit and memorialize someone. You got to put it on your car window because you're in your car all the time. We're constantly on the go. And it just it kind of made me sad a bit thinking, you know, like Enos here, you've got time to go out and and hunt and be one with nature and one with God and pour your heart out and wrestle you know, for, for all day and, and, and part of a night, you know, I just, I think, you know, simpler times are calling my name. So. It's good thoughts. Yeah. I, I honestly struggle, struggle with that. Feeling like I need to constantly be doing something with the kids, you need know, to be constantly kind of be doing something or constantly learning, constantly training, you know, constantly trying to improve, you know, why can't I just sit back and enjoy the evening? Right. No, no you know, time wasted. Right. No, yeah, exactly. No, no, no time wasted in mentality. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. I think that's a big challenge with our generation. Yeah. Is that, and that's why I say the hustle generation, you know, like yeah, I know. my, my youngest brother, he seems he could be content with just, and he's, he's the, you know, the type that sometimes, you know, back in the day when he was much younger, he would, he'd have a job and then he'd get paid in cash. And then he'd be like, okay, deuces. <laughs> <laughs> and he like wouldn't show up again. He'd go fishing or go like whatever, just go hang out until all of the money's gone. And he'd be like, okay, I guess I need to find another job, you know. And same thing, he'd work <laughs> at that place until he get two weeks of pay. And be like deuces, you know. And I would think sometimes, you know, here I am working full time, going to school full time, and I just he seems perfectly content and I'm going right. What's wrong with me. Like I haven't been fishing in two years. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. Th listen, I've had those, that exact thought. Like, why can't, why, what is it? Why can't I just be satisfied with just, you know, just, just taking it easy. You know what I mean? And, and enjoying it really trying to enjoy the time, the life, the life that you have with, with each other. Yeah. 
good thoughts. Yeah, uh, different uh, mindset. That, that reminds me, I had a job one time where um, we 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 used to get paid on Friday. I was working on a, a pipe crew. We were putting in, installing like storm drain, water main, and stuff like that. And These pipes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We won't go into that one though, but uh, so so the boss man um decided to pay us on Thursday, and he started to hand me my my check, and he he and then he pulled it back. He said, "If I if I pay you today, are you coming to work tomorrow?" <laughs> and I remember like it, it confused. I didn't even understand that question. It didn't make any <laughs> sense to me. I was like, "What do you mean? Why would I not come to work tomorrow? I don't I don't even understand what you're saying." And it was just funny because it, yeah. It, it didn't even occur to me that there are there were guys like that that as soon as they get that paycheck they're deuces i'm out yeah i'm gone for the weekend i'm gonna go i'm gonna go buy a case of beer and a carton of cigarettes and some worms from the local bait and tackle shop and yeah <laughs> and that's wow. it uh, it's like i got my paycheck when you coming back when this runs out <laughs> that's it. exactly and that's how that's how most of those kind of guys would operate. Yeah, they their check would be gone by Monday. So yeah, most of them would be back to work on Monday. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I will comment one other thing. Um, yep. and I think it's piggybacking off what Kenny was saying with the wrestling. That's a that's a very um bold word, I, I would say. And and I in my mind, it's the intentionality of it, right? Like it's not a casual thing, it's not a hypothetical thing. He was wrestling. And that, that to me implies significance and intention um, of, of what he's doing. And I think that's a big thing um, these days. I recently heard someone talking about um, kids these days and, you know, ADHD is off the charts and uh, you know, all this stuff. And I really wasn't paying attention. No, I'm just kidding. So anyway, the, <laughs> the, 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 the thing was, this guy was saying um, that, kids especially young boys these days have such a hard time focusing on schoolwork but they seem to have no problem spending hours in front of a screen right uh and he said that in his thinking it's because of consequences and intentionality like if you solve a math problem on a sheet of paper nothing happens you move on to the next thing and nothing happens yeah. but if you're playing a video game if you jump on a turtle shell, it goes shooting off and to another direction and makes a funny sound. And then you move on. And if you beat the bad guy, then a new screen appears with new lights flashing and noise and music and whatever. There's, there's a consequence to every action. There's a new thing around every corner. Whereas schoolwork is inconsequential. You just solve a problem and there's nothing. And I thought, wow, that's an interesting takeaway I'd never thought of before. And 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 again, it goes to acting with a little self-driven intent that, that you don't need the, the bells and whistles and things, that you know what you're in it for and you know what the consequence is, even though it's not flashing at you. And to me, that's a that's a big part of this with 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 Enos and wrestling. It is intentional. It is consequential, even though it took him all day and into the night before he was getting any of these answers. Right. And so that's that's just a big thing uh, uh, showing us the right way to go, I think. I like that. Good point. Yeah, there's a lot of. Yeah, a lot of genealogy here. So um, as always, yep. uh, definitely do your do your reading because the, uh, the the whole reading here, these books are so short. Um, you're looking at about 30 minutes altogether to read all this. So, um, 30 minutes. It's funny. Yeah, I was listening to uh, Brother Fulmer, and they 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 made a good point that most of these readings. What'd you say? 30 minutes. That's not according to the Fulmer the Fulmer Brothers clock. This thing take you about four minutes and 30 seconds to read. Well, that's <laughs> per day. <laughs> huh? He said that's per day. Yeah. If you break it down for the for you know the whole thing though you know most of they it's funny because you know they're the episode covering this lesson uh, they made the point that most of these lessons the readings are are down to about somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty minutes and so if you can't carve thirty minutes out of your week 
out of an entire week, if you can't carve out 30 minutes for reading your scriptures, you need to reevaluate your life. And that's right. <laughs> I love, I love speaking of the genealogy. Uh, I love how these individuals took the commandment to pass these plates down and to write and to keep them going over, over a couple hundred years. Yes. Uh, you know, to why, uh, how serious, like for just for example, verses eight and nine of the book of uh, Omni, it came to pass that I did deliver the plates unto my brother, Kimish uh, or Kimish, however you pronounce it. Now I yeah. Kimish write what few things I write in the same book with my brother. For behold, I saw the last which he wrote that he wrote it with his own hand, and he wrote it in the day that he delivered them unto me. And after this manner, we keep the records for it is according to the commandments of our fathers. And I make an end and behold, uh, I Abinadam and the son of Kamish. Anyway, they, they understood how important it was to pass these plates down that they didn't get lost, you know, in the forest somewhere, <laughs> get left behind or something. You know what I mean? I, I, I just, I, re I really, I really like that. Even though they didn't necessarily have any gospel teachings to to include yeah even yeah even the genealogies were important yeah definitely you ever wonder if that was part of the reason that they engraved on metal plates like this i mean not it's not just that they just didn't have paper yet that that is that is one factor but um if you're writing if if you're literally having to engrave these words onto thin metal plates it's, it's going to hold a lot of value you know things that, that you know this these writings could theoretically last forever you know like mm. bury them in the ground and somebody thousands of years later could dig them up and read them which is you what spill your drink on them and it'd be okay yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> which wouldn't work with a paper did. book or with it or right. the laptop right or any other means we have to communicate today yeah if you're if you're engraving on metal plates, then that's yeah, that's pretty secure right there. Very good. Well, very good. Until next time, y'all keep on striving. Mm -hmm.